Indian historians, uh, I won't call them into, uh, historians because they don't go deep into Tibetan history. It was 1959, October 5, when China invaded Tibet from the east and then we were forced to sign the 17-point agreement in May 23, 1951. The only way to handle China or bring China on its knees is give them less business. So many Indians yes. who do not want to buy Chinese goods, there are mm. so many Indians who are saying, we're willing to pay a premium. If India does not make it, America does, or Europe does, we're willing to pay a premium. But he said, we never even come to know. Mm. And this is, you know, my small little war that I've been fighting. What Pakistani people need is more job, more employment, more economic development, not nuclear missiles to kill other people. Doesn't it make more sense for you to be Somewhere in Malcha Marg or Chanakya Bursar. I keep telling the Europeans, the more you kowtow to the Chinese, the more they will ride you. Some of the, the friends tell me, oh, the dragon is biting at us, meaning China. Then I tell them, who fed the dragon to become so strong to be able to bite at you? In a sense, the more you feed the dragon, the more the dragon will bite you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Gap, the Gaurav Arya podcast. We've had a series of guests. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your support. Today we have a special guest, a very, very important guest, important for India, important for the rest of the world. It is my honor and privilege to welcome on our show, Sikyong Penpa Sharing. Tashid Alexa. Tashidile. Thank you very much for gracing our show, sir. And uh, it's a matter of great honor and privilege that you're here. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Sikyong is a title which means political uh, leader, loosely translated as president, as prime minister, essentially the key word here is Sikyong, which is political leader. Uh, of course, uh, Sikyong Penpashering is part of the uh, Central Tibetan Administration and he's here on our show on the Gauravarya podcast. Sir, my question to you is, Tibetans have really suffered under Chinese rule, sir. And it's not new. It's been going on even before His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, came to India. It's been happening yes. from before. A lot of people say that uh, there has been deliberate demographic change by the Chinese. They have put Han Chinese there. Mm. How much of this is true? Sir? We have read articles, but I've mm. never heard it from a, a bona fide source. So I would like to talk to you about this. Mm. It's very difficult to give an exact number of how many Chinese have already moved to Tibet because there are uh, Chinese business people who move into towns and cities where they can make money, but they don't go to villages. Then you also have a lot of floating populations in the form of uh, military, in the form of uh, migrant laborers who come from China, just like, <clears throat> you know, now that China is considered as the factory of the world when they can go as far as Latin America and Africa for resources and why not occupy Tibet? So you also have a lot of uh, people who work in the mining areas which are not accounted for because China has a very strange uh, hukou system, what they call it, the household listing. If you don't stay in one place for more than six months, you are not listed as a householder in that area. So that part is also there. But if you look from Eastern Tibet, uh, particularly from Amdo, let us say, then the city called Siling itself is about 2.2 million people. And out of that, uh, only about uh, less than 100,000 are Tibetans. So which means uh, Chinese are majority in that particular city coming from uh, Eastern Tibet. So overall, one could say today in Tibet, uh, over the last 40, 50 years, the number has increased. We have always been saying 6 million Tibetans, uh, not increased by one or decreased by one. But according to the latest Chinese census of 2020, it looks more likely that uh, the Tibetan number has over the years, over the decades, increased to 7.3 million. And uh, if you count all the Chinese in major Tibetan uh, cities and townships, then it could exceed the number of Tibetans in Tibet. The Tibetan diaspora is spread all over the world, sir. Yes. And we see that whenever there is uh, the Chinese premier or the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, or even before him. So there are regular protests and yes. the world takes notice. Because Tibet is something that is very close to the heart of a lot of people. Mm. Now, for a person who has had Tibetan friends 
and I'm not saying that I understand the issue completely, but mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. I have a little bit of an understanding of the issue, if mm-hmm. not more. I understand that it is occupied land. Mm-hmm. When was Tibet actually occupied by the Chinese? <coughs> because the Tibetans had their own kings and they had their mm-hmm. own kingdom, the kingdom of Tibet. It was there. When mm-hmm. was it occupied by the Chinese kingdoms earlier? So when was that? Mm-hmm. Now, maybe we should uh, uh, do a short overview of the history of Tibet. Uh, Tibet has a uh, uh, well-accepted history of more than 2,200, 2,300 years. And before that, of course, the Shangshung dynasty and all that. So it goes back many thousands of years. Um, but the uh, there are also stories that the first king of Tibet came from India, uh, Prince Rupati. Uh, so the India... Tibet relations is very, very old. And then there was also a sacred text, a Buddhist text in the hand of a Tibetan king in 3rd century. Uh, that was the first Buddhist text into Tibet. And then 7th century, the Tibetan emperor sent a, 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 a minister to invent a Tibetan script. So the Tibetan script also comes from India. It's uh, based on Brahmi and Gupta script. Because some people ask us, since now that uh, Tibet is occupied by China, whether Tibetan language has anything to do with Chinese language, which is not. It came from, the script came from India. Even now, if I say kaka khanga, cha cha chanya, tata thana, it's very similar to Indian, Hindi consonants. Yes. And we have only four vowels, e, u, a, o, whereas you have a, a, e, e, u, u, a, o, a, maha, so many vowels. So the, the language also comes from India. And then between 7th to 9th century, Tibet was a huge empire. We even uh, dislodged the Chinese emperor and put a puppet king there in the uh, Chinese capital of Xiangyang those days, or Xiang. And the Tibetan empire also extended up to present day Samarkand uh, in Uzbekistan. So that used to be the extent of Tibetan empire between 7th to 9th century. Then Tibet disintegrated for about 400 years. Then Genghis Khan became a big power in Central Asia. And we built relations with the fifth Khan, uh, Kublai Khan, and his father with the Sajapas. So we built relations with the Mongols around 1247 uh, with uh, Kublai Khan's father. And later, um, Sajap Pandita's nephew uh, worked with Kublai Khan. As the, then we developed this peace patron relationship. So the Mongols invaded China in 1271. And then it became the Yuan dynasty. So Mongols were there even before Yuan dynasty and after Yuan dynasty. But for the Chinese historians, from 1271 to 1368 was the period when Mongols ruled China. It's not the Chinese who ruled China, but the Mongols ruled China from China. And then Tibet was ruled by the Sakyapas during that period. And then following the Mongol invasion of China, the Mongols were dislodged by the Mings who are the real Chinese, Han Chinese, because you're talking about 56 nationalities within China, and Han Chinese are the majority. Of course, there are a lot of intellectual discourses as to who's a real Chinese, uh, Mongol Chinese, Manchu Chinese, Tibetan Chinese. If Mongols are Chinese, then China can claim half of the world because Genghis Khan conquered that much area. Uh, so the Mings uh, ruled China from 1368 to 1644, whereas Tibet in comparative uh, uh, history was ruled by three dynasties. The Pamaduba dynasty for about 100 years, Rimpungpa for about 100 years, then Depa Sangba for about 100 years from 1368 to 1642. Um, then the fifth Dalai Lama took over the spiritual and temporal leadership in 1642, two years before the Manchus or the Qings uh, uh, dislodged the Mings. In China, so you can see a difference of two years where the fifth Dalai Lama. So since then, from 1642 to till now, the successive Dalai Lamas have been ruling Tibet, and then China was ruled by the Manchus, who are uh, not Chinese. The societal perspective of uh, the Chinese people is that Manchus are not Chinese; they are invaders, they are barbarians. So you build those. Uh, a great wall to keep the barbarians away. So today the great wall is the back wall, not the boundary of China with what they call as the barbarians for Mongols, Manchus, Tibetans and all that. So around 1720, uh, after the fifth Dalai Lama, the sixth Dalai Lama came, 
and then the Manchus came into Tibet, essentially to support the Tibetans against the Kurka invasion, Nepalese invasion of Tibet. But they didn't have to fight a war. Uh, they went back they, without having to fight a war. Again, they came back in 1790s, uh, late 18th century, and then they claimed that they invented this golden urn for the selection of Dalai Lama and all that. So those were Manchu influences in Tibet. But Tibet was not never directly ruled by the Chinese, uh, you know, till the end of the Manchu Empire. On, in between, you had the uh, young husband expedition of Tibet uh, in 1904, when young husband, tradition, young husband came up to Lhasa in 1904. But where were the Chinese then? And uh, Indian historians, uh, I won't call them into, uh, historians because they don't go deep into Tibetan history, but at least uh, those who study about Tibet, they like to say Tibet became independent since 1913. Because we kicked out every single Chinese from Tibet in 1912. So that is why you still see some uh, Chinese in Kolkata, because we didn't send them directly through Tibet, but send them through India so that they don't come back with reinforcement. But by that time, the nationalists had taken over and they were not very much in a position to... It was a very interesting piece yeah. of history, sir. So, yeah. They went to Calcutta. They were sent through Calcutta, back to China. So many of them stayed back uh, in Kalimpong, Darjeeling area. Okay. But after 1962 war, they were also removed from those places and some of them still stay in Kolkata. That is why you still have... Not all the Chinese in Kolkata were from Tibet. Uh, because the 13th Dalai Lama went to... After the young husband expedition had to leave to Mongolia and then again to China uh, from... 1904 to 1909 and then the 13th Dalai came back to Tibet took about a year for him to come because he also preaches on the way and three months after he was in Lhasa the Chinese came from Kham area they killed so many Khampas in 1910 and it took two years for the Tibetans to kick out every Chinese and then the 13th Dalai Lama reiterated the independence of Tibet not announced like it's a new country, you know, it was there. So then Mongolia and Tibet also signed an agreement. You know, and then there was the Shimla Agreement of 1914, where MacMahon line was devised between British India and independent Tibet. So even today, we are committed to the uh, Shimla Agreement and the MacMahon line because we were signatories to that. Chinese were part of it, but they did not ratify it uh, eventually. So, uh, so all those uh, historical relations were there and Tibet remained an independent state till Chinese occupation in 1950 when China uh, forcefully occupied Chamdo in eastern Tibet and that was the um, uh, attack of the garrison, eastern garrison and then we were forced to sign this so-called 17 point agreement in 1951. That is why even now I keep telling the international community we have only one agreement or uh, uh, you know with the Chinese, communist China, Chinese, that is the 17 point agreement and then they themselves trampled on every provision of that agreement, all the 17 points. We try to live under that agreement for the for eight years, from 1951 to 1959, before His Holiness came into exile. Uh, so since China trampled on all the provisions, then we had to also abrogate that agreement. Uh, so it was 1959, October 5, when China invaded Tibet from the east, and then we were forced to sign this 17-point agreement in May 23, 1951. So there was a significant time, sir, more than thousands of years when Tibet yes. was absolutely, it had its own identity. Yes. It had its own politics, its own religion, its own culture, its own script, its own language, its own food. Yes. Nothing to do with China. Rather, Not Tibetans had at one point in time conquered China, sat in their capital and like you mentioned, sir. There was the, also this story about when we developed relations with Mongols. Yeah. Mongols were merciless. They, they, you know, Genghis Khan, if he had to invade Delhi, he comes from Panipat and he kills everybody in Panipat. By the time he reaches Delhi, everybody surrenders because he's merciless. Yes. And they were killing a lot of Chinese. They were throwing Chinese into the sea. And the Tibetan masters told them not to kill the Chinese. Actually, Tibetans saved Chinese life during the Mongol times <laughs> in the initial state. But we have to suffer this fate, not having done anything against the Chinese. But now we are suffering under the Chinese. 
my question is sir that uh, you know this is about the history and yeah. how his holiness uh, mm. came to india mm. in exile what is the way forward i mean from the global community because everybody makes the right noises <coughs> yes everybody says the right thing mm. apart from china nobody to my mind will say that no no the tibet cause is not a good cause and we know everybody mm. supports it whatever i've seen little bit mm. there could be one or two odd people but otherwise mm. all nations generally have a very soft corner they love tibet mm. they want to support tibet but what is the way forward so do you think there is a way forward do you think that tibet will be free because we would love to see a free tibet but yes. uh, what can india do what can the world do mm. because china is not going to just simply leave one day so they are not going to do that now free tibet and independent tibet are two different things with independence then you are talking about an independent nation free also includes freedom without uh, a nation being sovereign in that sense so one of the biggest concern for the chinese government has always been sovereignty you know when they can want to expand the whole of south china sea then why not occupy tibet so sovereignty has always been a major issue with the chinese and uh, since the occupation of tibet by china there have been a lot of problems for the tibetans whether it's in terms of uh, freedom of religious practice or the 10 long years of cultural revolution where they destroyed everything old from 1966 to 76 um so there have been lot the, the whole issue was whether we will be able to preserve the identity of the tibetans if the identity of the tibetans are not there it doesn't make sense to have a country or a people without those values so we are talking about the global significance of tibet not just from the historical perspective but also the geostrategic importance of tibet tibet being located in the center of asia um bordering so many countries uh, uh tibet being an unexploited land you know you, with lot of resources because it's huge 2.37 million square kilometers some say 2.5 million square kilometers which is about quarter of china and then you also talk about tibet's importance uh, uh, from a ecological or environmental point of view because tibet is now called as the third pole roof of the world uh, watchtower of asia uh, it extends much beyond uh, tibet uh, you know in the whole region the even indian uh, monsoon is decided by the jet streams that flow over the tibetan plateau and the warming up of the pacific in the form of el nino all these contributors which are going to be the depression areas in india which are going to be the hot places in india where where there is depression the clouds come in and then you have more rainfall so all these have lot of implications because of the tibetan plateau the high tibetan plateau so those are also there and then we have always considered ourselves as a repository of one part of ancient indian wisdom will we transliterate every available sanskrit and pali texts buddhist texts into tibetan from 8th to 13th century before buddhism almost vanished out of india and today we are very proud to say that tibetan language is the only language from which you can learn buddhism in its true essence right now we are in the process of transliterating it back into sanskrit the original text you know so the languages are very similar and uh, Uh, so we are very proud to say that we are repository of one part of ancient wisdom which is manifested in the messages of his holiness the dalai lama through peace and compassion you know all those values which human beings need and particularly at this point of time as we speak of course we hear more about israel gaza now lebanon hezbollah iran all that and then ukraine russia Well, but there are some 55 conflicts going on violent conflicts going on around uh, this world as we speak so the message of peace and non-violence is very important what's happening in gaza are we really resolving the present crisis or are we creating more problems for future because the, all the young kids are going to witness all the destruction that's happening with properties and lives so we have always believed that if there has to be a a uh, lasting solution to any conflict then it can only be through nonviolence violence will be get more violence as as mahatma gandhi ji also said that an eye for an eye will make the whole world blind so this is never a solution then when there is too much violence then people are driven by emotions not by logic not by reason 
and this escalates into more violence. And what's happening in the Middle East is very, very sad. So that is why the the understanding of ancient Indian wisdom in the form of understanding the concept of oneness of humanity, whether we are black or white or yellow or whatever, we are all human beings. All 8 billion people are human beings in this, with the same intellect. Uh, so if we can think on those concepts and also think about the interdependent nature of our existence, we are all social animals. Humans cannot survive singularly or individually. We have to depend on a community and the larger community is the global stage. So uh, if we understand these concepts that something that happens in one part of the world has its impact on the other part of the world, then we will be more responsible uh, people. Uh, including leaders like Putin or Xi or whoever it is. You know, if they can think on those lines, then this world will naturally be a more peaceful world. Otherwise, it's going to lead to a lot of uh, uh, catastrophic consequences if what is happening is true. Just this morning, I was reading about United States going to rework on its nuclear programs because there's too much threat from Russia and China or North Korea for that matter. So <clears throat> all this dynamism in global politics is also not taking the world in the right direction or the positive direction. So my recommendation is for the Europeans also, I keep telling them, okay, you support Ukraine with armaments and all that. That's good because Ukrainian people are also very brave to be able to, you know, resist and defend their country. It is very important. Otherwise, it will have consequences elsewhere in the world about China's ambitions in Taiwan or maybe Russia's ambition elsewhere also. But the, if we think from a non-violent perspective, the only way to handle China or bring China on its knees is give them less business. So you talk about 27 EU countries, they import 600 billion US dollars worth of goods and services from China and export only 200 billion. So you're talking about a 400 billion trade imbalance every single year. Uh, even in India, despite all the rhetoric and belligerence on the border, trade is going up, which is not good. $125 billion dollars per year, sir. Yes. And uh, mm. yeah, India's uh, 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 the foreign exchange reserve is going up a little bit as of yesterday. So, But then trade imbalance with China is increasing all the time. That's right. And right now, China needs all that money. They were... A year or one and a half years ago, China was talking about $3.6 trillion worth of foreign exchange reserve, which they splurge on Belt and Road Initiative, on space technology, on military technology, and uh, high-end equipment, you know, maybe even microchips, which now they are getting strangled by tariffs from the United States. So they are doing things which the free world does not want them to do. Uh, and all these are uh, be augmented by the business uh, surplus they have. So now there are serious uh, issues about overcapacity. Tariffs from U.S. government, Canadian government, 100% on Chinese EV cars. And just yesterday, the European Union also decided to impose this tariff of 17 to 34%, 35%, over and above the 10% that they levy on imports. So those... Those things are happening, and China's now pivot is more towards the global south. Now the question is, how much purchasing power does the global south have? You know, it's mostly the Europeans, because they want both their hegemonistic ambitions in the region and fuel defense expenditure by all the countries around China. At the same time, they want European market and American market, because it's, it's not possible to get both. And I think the Europeans are also waking up to that. America has learned it the hard way since 2000 when Clinton decided to, at the, or at the beginning of uh, Bush Jr.'s, uh, uh, you know, tenure to include China in the World Trade Organization, free trade agreement with uh, United States, and then also China getting the, uh, you know, opportunity to host what they call as the coming out party, the Olympics, you know. And that also resulted in the U.S. Tibet policy of uh, 2002. The U.S. is the only country that has a law on Tibet. So U.S. has learned the hard way. We all hope that if we make China part of the global community, they'll become more responsible. But unfortunately, today, China has gone in a direction where 
uh, when the whole world is moving towards multiculturalism, China is the only one that's moving towards uniculturalism. Um, so, and become more irresponsible. Uh, we're talking about multipolar world, bipolar world, so it's still shaping up. It's still very fluid, very dynamic. Whether it will be multipolar or whether it's going to be bipolar, whether we agree or not, it's definitely a war between democracy and authoritarianism. So China being, in, being the biggest bully, try to get all other smaller bullies with them. So now you have new abbreviations like CRINK, C, C for China, R for Russia, I for Iran, NK for North Korea. So those kind of things are also evolving. Then now you have a lot of multilateral forums also coming up like Quad, AUKUS, because of China's behavior in the region. <coughs> so, yeah, there are a lot of things happening right now. It's pretty you know, interesting. No, I, I, absolutely. Mm. Uh, mm. One thing, sir, which, uh, you know, I've always been advocating, mm. uh, hitting China economically. Yes. So we, we, we shop on Amazon and we shop on Flipkart and yes. there's billions of dollars worth of business every year. All we need to do mm. is on the photograph of that, let's say I'm buying, uh, yeah. for example, a watch Yes. On, on Amazon or on Flipkart or any other platform mm. for that matter, online, it should show the Chinese flag. The Let me country, be informed. Country of origin. Country of origin, sir. Yeah. Any country, it could be US, China. Yeah. There are so many Indians yes. who do not want to buy Chinese goods. There are mm. so many Indians who are saying, we're willing to pay a premium. If India mm. does not make it, America does, or Europe mm. does, we're willing to pay a premium. But he said, we never even come to know. Mm. And this is, you know, my small little war that I have been fighting, mm -hmm. that at least put the flag of the country of origin so yes. I can make an informed choice. And then if an Indian wants to buy Chinese goods, because so you know what happened in Galwan, mm. right? Mm. You know what happened in 62, in 67, Nathula. Yeah. Yeah. And the more we do business with China, the more we fund the Chinese army, mm. the more we fund the PLA, because where is that money going? It's, it's, mm. And we don't even know which companies we're doing business with. Mm. I did a detailed research and it seems that many of the bigger companies, mm. especially in telecom and electronics are actually owned by the PLA. Sir. There are so many companies that are owned by the PLA, the mm. shareholding of the PLA, <coughs> the People's Liberation Army. So it's obviously a threat mm. as far as India is concerned. Now, mm. uh, so uh, I had asked this question, I mean, uh, around 10 minutes before uh, mm. we were having this, that what can the world do? It's time to pressurize China. China is not going to give mm. you even, let's say, so we say free Tibet. Mm. What does it mean? Uh, basic modicum of human rights and mm. freedom for the Tibetan people, the preservation mm. of their culture, their values, yes. uh, their heritage, their religion. Mm. Is that it? Or we are also talking about sovereignty. Sovereignty is Chinese get out, mm. Tibet to be ruled by Tibetans only. Mm. And when the Chinese come, they need a visa. If at all, it is permitted by the Tibetan government. So what yes. are we talking about here, sir? We uh, officially, uh, the stated position of the Central Tibetan Administration uh, is the middle way policy. Uh, it's a Buddhist concept uh, drawn into political connotations. Uh, when we say middle way policy, then you also have to understand that there are polarities or extremities, otherwise there is no middle way. Um, the idea behind is that, of course, when His Holiness started thinking about the middle way that was in the beginning of 70s, and uh, you can imagine what was going on inside Tibet with Cultural Revolution where everything being destroyed. The concern was how do we preserve our identity and our people. So with that, uh, and taking the reality into situation, even countries like India, who will have been Tibet's neighbor for millennia from the, from the beginning of this creation of this world, whenever civilization started, people started existing. Um, we were there. But Indian government has its own position, its own interests. And uh, I've always been saying if there has to be a resolution to the Sino-Tibet conflict uh, through the middle way policy, there is no other way than by talking with the Chinese government. Uh, for negotiated, uh, you know, mutually beneficial, lasting solution. Until such a time, uh, we'll have to reach out to the international community. And we should also know that the international community, including India, will not leave aside India's national interests and take Tibet's national interests. That is not possible. So our idea would be to see how can we align our interests with that nation's interests. If that can be aligned, then there could be some traction. 
Uh, since I came into this office, I was in the parliament for 20 years and speaker for seven and a half years. And after five years now, break, I came into this office. Uh, when we came into the office, we started changing our strategy a little bit uh, by focusing on the, by focusing or seeking recognition for the polarities. So one polarity is the present status of occupied Tibet under the repressive Chinese government. And the other polarity is the historical status of Tibet as an independent state. So we started working with the U.S. Congress from April 2022. Then there was change in the House, you know, a few months later. And then we started working again from beginning of 2023. And we have reached a stage where the President, President Joe Biden had signed the Resolve Tibet Act, which talks about four major issues, all um, uh, going against China's stated positions. Uh, China keeps saying there is no Tibet issue or Tibet problem. And the act, this act, uh, the Resolve Tibet Act says that uh, Tibet is yet an unresolved conflict and uh, it should be resolved under international law. And the second point it talks about is the Tibetan people's right to self-determination, which was also enshrined in the 1961 General Assembly UN resolution when we approached the UN in 59, 61 and 65. Then the third angle was not accepting China's narrative that Tibet was part of China since antiquity or ancient times. His Holiness also not accepted that. His Holiness has always, because this used to be one of China's preconditions that His Holiness should say that China was part of, uh, Tibet was part of China. And His Holiness always has very wise answers to all these tricky questions. His Holiness says, I'm not a historian. Let's leave history to historians. So what we are looking through uh, through the middle way policy is a mutually beneficial solution, both for the Chinese people and the Tibetan people, and that could have cascading uh, effect on the whole region in South China, in, in in South Asia, even China's relation with Pakistan, what they call as all weather friendship, higher than sky, deeper than ocean, sweeter than honey, kind of. If there's better relations between India and China, there's no need for China to supply Pakistan with all this nuclear, uh, you know, long range missiles. But what Pakistani people need is more job, more employment, more economic development, not nuclear missiles to kill other people. So all this dynamism uh, could change, you know. So, so now the next step for us is how do we work with other like-minded countries? Because we can reach out only to free world. We cannot reach out to authoritarian regions, even developing countries, because they are too much in debt with uh, China, China creating all this debt, not just in Asian continent, where from South China Sea, you have Malacca Strait, you have now uh, Cambodia not being able to pay back loans to Chinese government, and they've taken part of the Sihanouk wheel port. Cocoa Islands have already been taken by China. That also uh, monitors the whole Bay of Bengal yes. in the area, which is a huge security threat to India. Now they have taken over Hamantota port in Sri Lanka. So with all these trajectories, now they are mapping all this other sea. Uh, so they know where the pipelines are, where the, you know, internet lines are, warning signals. So it's a huge security threat. Now with uh, President Muji coming here, hope uh, <laughs> Muji will learn his lessons uh, you know, uh, cozying up to China will be detrimental for, for Maldives, even though India may be acting like a big brother, but that also to some extent should be ex acceptable. Hopefully, Muji's visits this time would be useful in connecting India and Maldives together. By the way, China sent Tibet's glacier water to, to Maldives as a diplomatic tool to, uh, to provide drinking water for Maldivians. And uh, China and Pakistan's relation with China and the Pakistan Economic Corridor also coming up, connecting Gwadar with uh, uh, China and then Gwadar with whole of Arab Arabian Sea, China's relation with Iran, Saudi, you know, building back those diplomatic relations, its control on Djibouti, where they might be even in a position to place war missionaries if there is a conflict in the region in Djibouti. And one of our friends from England, a member of parliament, was not allowed to enter Djibouti because of China's pressure. You know, so And debts in African countries, where African countries are <laughs> really having problem reworking on repayment of the loans. And those, those loans are also being restructured. So 
I keep saying when China is pivoting towards the global south, we also have to understand how much purchasing power does the global south have. It's not much. It's purchasing power is all with Europe and free countries, right? So if China floods all these countries with all their capa- overcapacity, not just electric vehicles, then it's going to kill all the small-scale industries and medium-scale industries. And we should be speaking about this now to, to these countries before they realize that it's too late. Uh, so there are a lot of implications on China's behavior and political, geopolitical, geostrategic issues uh, globally. Yeah. Uh, my question is that, uh, you know, so you're in McLeod Ganj, mm. that is where the government is. Yes. It's in Himachal Pradesh. Sir. Mm. The question that occurs to me is, why not Delhi? The reason why I'm saying that mm. is, if the Central Tibetan administration mm. moves lock, stock and barrel mm. from McLeod Ganj mm. to Delhi. Mm. The entire diplomatic core of the world is here. Yes. It becomes very easy for you as mm. the head of, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 the political dispensation, so to say. Mm. Tomorrow you could just go and meet the American ambassador or or maybe some visiting uh, Secretary of State could come and meet you, have a cup of mm. coffee with you and discuss. Mm. Doesn't it make more sense for you to be somewhere in Malcha Marg or Chanakya Puri, sir? Mm. A building, Tibetan government in exile, mm. whatever you want to call it, whatever is the correct nomenclature, sir. Mm. I, I don't know, I'm not aware. Mm. That. And a smart bunch of young Tibetans mm. to support you, mm. who go everywhere, and I'm I'm thinking aloud. These have been mm. my thoughts for so many years, for so many decades. Mm. Uh, I personally feel very strongly about this. Mm. Maybe an office building in Washington DC, in London, in four or five other things where mm. the Tibetan cause out of a proper structure. Mm. And this has nothing to do with McLeod Ganj. I mean, lovely place. Mm. But when you talk about geopolitics, and you've been talking about geopolitics for yes. the past half an hour. Yes. Geopolitics in India will happen out of New Delhi. There is no other way to do it and no mm. other place to do it. Mm. What do you feel about this? The distance at one time used to be a constraint because when we came first also, His Solness landed on Indian soil on March 31st, 1959. Then he went to Tezpur and to Masuri and he stayed there for almost one year. And that was the place designated by the Indian government for us to go. And one year after that, the Indian government asked us to go to Dharamsala. So it is... Uh, uh, calculation from the Indian government side. Even this office, when we first started, uh, it was not easy. Uh, the name boards were removed and then we had to put it back and, you know, all those things. So eventually, it got the name Bureau of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in consultation with the government of India. So for every step that we have to take, uh, of course, we have to seek consent um, and agreement on whatever move we make. But right now, I would say distance from Dharamsala to here, now there is plane, uh, you can reach in one hour. It's not a major issue. I can meet the American ambassador we met last time also. So it's not a major, our office here, uh, our office in Washington DC, we also have office in Washington DC, we also have an office in London. Um, in fact, t- uh, Tibetans are the only uh, political uh, refugees uh, who have organized themselves into a fully democratic functional polity. Uh, no other community has that. Uyghurs have elections, but they are not answerable to parliament. We have our Supreme Justice Commission, we have a parliament in exile. So I'm responsible for the management of this institution. So we have to spend almost six months to manage the institutions and then spend six months to deal with the Tibetan community in diaspora spread across more than 25 different countries. 37 locations in India, 10 different states, two Indian territories, two, two Union territories, Nepal, Bhutan, everywhere. So it is a challenge, but we have over the last 65 years built institutions. Now we are uh, into e-governance. Um, we have civil servants. We have 600, more than 600 civil servants. Uh, we have 12, 13 offices around the world, which functions like our diplomatic missions. Um, of course, we have a lot of constraints, both human and financial resources. Uh, but despite that, of course, uh, the persona of His Holiness the Dalai Lama had kept the Tibetan issue alive for so long, and it's directly linked to His Holiness uh, um, uh, persona. So 
in that sense, we have been a very, very successful uh, community. We are not lacking behind in advocacy or reaching out to countries because now I've traveled to more than 25 different countries over the last three years. I have to travel more. Tomorrow night, I'm tonight, I'm going to Europe uh, to, to visit some more countries. So all these things happen. It's not just the distance. I think now the main issue is the strategy. How do you go about reaching out to countries? I keep saying we should know exactly which button to press for which light. You know, we just can't be groping in the dark and work so hard and then feel that there's no result. Then you end up having fatigue. Well, so I'm sorry I'm interrupting you. What, yeah. I, what I meant to ask was when I said that a presence in Washington or yeah. presence in London, you said that you're already present there. Mm. I was talking about skills. Yes, yes. Scale, mm. not a, a proper mm. quote-unquote embassy building, sir. Mm. Proper. Mm. With a proper ambassador, with a proper, I mean, things at a certain level, mm. at a certain scale, like maybe mm. the UK High Commission in India or the Indian High, something of that mm. level, because uh, clearly I think more push needs to be there diplomatically at least, sir. That's also there, that, but then there also needs to be political restructuring about their policies on Tibet. For example, UK coined this term suzerainty. Uh, you just talk about sovereignty in name, not, not real sovereignty. So they changed their policy in 2008. And so now we have to work towards getting that reverse first and then get them on board to support to something similar to what U.S. has done on the result of that. So there's a lot of work to do. Uh, uh, we, we have a lot more work to do. It's not easy. We have to cross a lot more boundaries to, to be able to put pressure on the Chinese government so that they come on the negotiating table. My last question to you is, sir, yeah. what can India do better to help the dividend cost? <clears throat> now, one thing that everybody has been saying is to strengthen the Central Tibetan Administration. Um, now, we managed to survive for the last 65 years, uh, mainly because of the help from the Indian government and also leadership of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Now His Holiness is 89, he's going to be 90 uh, very soon. So he doesn't move as much as uh, he used to. But now the responsibility rests on the Tibetan leadership. We are common people, ordinary people. Um, so there needs to be support to strengthen the existence of CTA. You were suggesting about expanding the structure. Even expanding structures need a lot of financial support. Yes, sir. You pay for people, to, you know, infrastructure and all that. So that could be one area if India is not willing to directly intervene in finding a resolution, which may not be on the cards right now, but in future there could be opportunities. But presently, to, to keep the Central Tibetan Administration active, vibrant, uh, there needs to be support, you know, not only from the government of India, but also other governments who are interested in that. So this is one. But political support will largely depend on how China's behavior is. You know. So India has, um, I'm at least personally uh, happy that India has taken a more stronger position because China respects only strength, not weakness. That much we know. Uh, so. Uh, with present uh, position of the Chinese, uh, of the Indian government, whether it's the Prime Minister speaking or the Defence Minister speaking or the um, MEA Minister Jai Shankar speaking, I think it's very clear that it's now it's not restricted only to disengagement, but for permanent peace on the border. Absolutely. So that should be the ultimate, uh, because China keeps salami slicing, they come in 20 kilometers, you push them back by 10 and they are already in 10 kilometers, which they are very good in doing. So now we cannot take all that. Indian government cannot take all that. Uh, uh, so the India's position has now become much more stronger. And I keep telling the Europeans, the more you kowtow to the Chinese, the more they will ride you. You are on your two legs. You kowtow more and more, your hands will also be on the ground and you'll become like a donkey and the Chinese will keep, Chinese will keep riding you. Then I also tell the, our friends in Europe, some of the, the friends tell me, oh, the dragon is biting at us, meaning China. Then I tell them, who fed the dragon to become so strong to be able to bite at you? 
it's United States government. You don't have to read too many books. Just read one book, Kissinger on China, and you will know whenever China was able to fall, United States came to support it. And then the European investment. Even now, you look at German position. Look at the Spanish position when Prime Minister of Spain visited China, and now he took a U-turn on the on the voting on EV tariffs. So uh, I t tell them, see, you know that the dragon is biting at you now. You know who fed the dragon to become so strong. Now, knowing that the dragon is biting at you, if you still keep feeding the dragon, I think that yes. lesson also applies for India. If you still keep, keep feeding the dragon, then whose fault is it? Yes. It's not Chinese fault. It's not Chinese. It's our fault yes. that we are giving business and they are attacking us. Absolutely. All sir. fronts. Thank you very much, sir, for yeah. talking to us. It was uh, absolutely a pleasure. Thank and you. I have spoken my heart out and so have you. Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with uh, Sikyong uh, Penpasheri, he heads the uh, political uh, establishment, so to say. And uh, a lot of things were spoken, especially about China, history of Tibet, <laughs> what India should be doing, what Europe should be doing. Henry Kissinger came out briefly for five or ten seconds and of course what the United States of America is doing. In a sense, the more you feed the dragon, the more the dragon will bite you. The only answer to this dragon question is stop feeding the dragon and take firm positions. Thank you very much, sir. Thank and you. It was indeed Thank an you. honor and a privilege, sir. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure.